uh, what I'm supposed to do is pick one, uh, and I'm picking all. So uh, you'll have to excuse perhaps the discombobulation that may seem like comes from those. They're talking about the same thing, but uh, they don't flow as well. I don't care. Here we go. Seven different ways. Um, why do you think God created us? Let's just start with something small. <laughs> Relationship, family, worship, worship him, glorify. To tell people about him. Something else was over here. Love. It's all about love, 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 love. To make disciples. Intimacy. What did you say? To be conduits of his blessing. Bear his image. To partner with him. For his joy. To experience the fullness of himself. In reality, there's a lot of answers that are part of the answer. right? It's hard to boil down the answer to that in just one thing that can fully encapsulate everything. Um, but you know... I often hear um, people I'm trying to like I, I want to say this in the right way um, try to boil it down right so I, I don't think that they actually in their theology think that it's only about this one thing I think that it is an important thing but I just think that there's there's so much more to what's happening but oftentimes I hear people boil down the creation of people to the glory of God now, I think there's a whole lot of other things that are built into that that result in God being glorified. But here's a reality. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that every knee will bow. Every, in, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow and give glory to God. But can I submit something to us this morning? I don't think God sent his son just to have people who will bow. Can I submit another thought? There's a difference in the type of glory that is brought between somebody who will suddenly come face to face with the king of kings and the lord of lords and bow saying, oh, I was wrong. But he is lord. There's a difference between that glory which is due him and he will receive. And there's my king. Oh, there's my king. There's my king. There's a difference. And he receives the glory. But you have to ask yourself, which glory do you think he's after? Which glory do you think he created us for? Intro number one. <laughs> mm. Would you turn to Revelation chapter 19 and stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God? I'm going to begin in chapter 6. Now, what do you guys know about the book of Revelation? That's a dangerous question to ask some of the people in this room, right? But, like, in general, what is the book of Revelation? The testimony of Jesus regarding what? The end, right? It's literally, like, the end of the Bible. It's the last book for a reason, right? It is talking about things that were yet to come. And even still yet, things that are yet to come. It is God trying to tell us, as he has been telling us for thousands of years, this is what I'm doing. God is able to tell us this is what is going to happen, and it will still yet, when it happens, blow your mind. But it's important for us to understand where we're headed, because it helps us put into context what we're doing right now. 
what this is for, what this has been moving towards. Sorry, in your timeline goes this way. What this has been moving towards all along. Remember I shared last week, if you were with us, I talked about the conversation I had with Lindsay where I said, hey, do you remember this event, Thanksgiving this year? Do you remember uh, when, we, when we got married? Do you remember when, when we, we first started dating? And I said, do you remember Christmas or Thanksgiving 2026? She's like, well, no, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened to us yet. We don't understand that. But God, to God, everything that is coming, everything that for us is the future, he already sees, he already knows, and it is the same unto him as is a memory is to us of the past. He can fully be in that moment. And he sees and interacts with us in our present with the fullness of his understanding and experience of what is still yet to come for an eternity. And that should blow your mind, but that's the God who created you for very deep purposes. So let's just take a short, quick glimpse at one of the things that is to come. Because in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul will talk to husbands and how to be husbands towards their wife because he says, this is a mystery that is profound, but I'm telling you, it refers to Christ and his bride, the church. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, he tells them, I am trying to to, to, to pour out truth over you, to wash you in truth so that you would be presented to he whom you have been betrothed, your bridegroom, Christ. So we're seeing this terminology of the church being the bride of Christ. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9 says this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Father. I thank you for your word. And right now, Lord, I want to pray over these people, the people in this room, the people who were here on video, on Spotify, the people to whom these people will speak to of these truths. I want to borrow, I want to plagiarize a prayer that you, Holy Spirit, inspired Paul to pray for the Ephesians church. For this reason, I bow my knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of your glory, that you may grant these people to be strengthened with power through your spirit in their inner being, so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that they being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to you who are able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. 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 And I'm going to add one more thing, Father.
I pray this morning that you would make us put our money where our mouth is. We sang that we receive your rain like a flood. Your love when you come. We receive your love when you come. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would flood the hearts of every person in this room right now. Throughout the words of this message today, would you flood our hearts to understand what it is that you died for us to understand? We cannot afford to miss it. The world cannot afford to miss it. I thank you for your love. We receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, this weekend, I had the opportunity to... um, to spend some time with a couple of guys that uh, actually from my last church that I was in a small group with, and uh, they happen to live in the same neighborhood now, and um, got together with them, and there were a couple of other guys that were from their neighborhood that came over as well. So it was the five of us, and I was meeting the two guys from the neighborhood for the very first time, and uh, one of the guys was brand new to everybody, and... um, just through conversation, uh, one of the guys, he, he asked, he said, hey, so are you guys like all religious or whatnot? And of course, you know, I'm kind of like, calm down, buddy, don't like. So they were kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, I have a question that like I love asking people. Um, and I love asking religious people. I wanted to, to, to ask you guys. He's like, there's no right or wrong answer. I just, just, just want to hear what your thought is. And so I'm like, all right. Let's see where this goes. I'm all about wherever this conversation is headed. <laughs> and he goes, when a person dies, do they carry their religion with them to the afterlife is what he said. A lot of people are like, I haven't been heard that one. I haven't been asked that one before. <laughs> Just thinking through. And I thought, through, bless you. I thought through. And I answered him, I said, you know, I don't want to get into semantics, but when I talk about my faith uh, as a Christian, uh, we have this phrase that we use that it's not about religion. It's about a relationship, right? Religion says do this and don't do that. Relationship is something entirely different. So in that context, if you're asking do I take with me the relationship that began here on this earth into the afterlife? The answer is yes, I do. And it's going to be even better when I get there. It was funny. I, there was just a bunch of other guys. There's a um, one of the, one of the uh, other dudes was a was a good old boy. Um, uh, he he proclaimed to be a follower. He had like a dip in his mouth or whatever, and and uh, and he had already answered or whatnot. And he goes. I take it back. I, I take it back. That's that's my answer right there. That's right, let's do that one. But there's truth in that, right? It's not about religion. It was interesting, actually, um, where he was coming from. He did the same thing. He was kind of playing off of religion and talking about faith, saying out his faith. And in his mind, he was kind of like trying to be uh, creative in saying that. Faith, which is interesting, he used a a biblical term for faith, a biblical definition for faith. He said, well, faith is belief in things unseen, so when you die, you will see. So no, you don't take your, it's no longer faith because you actually see it. It's not faith, whatever it is, whatever you believe and all these things. But he was using the term religion, uh, which in the end, neither of us use the term religion. So, But the point here that I'm trying to make is it's about a relationship. We were created for a relationship, and we have to understand that's what we began with because that's what we're headed towards, and that's what everything in between is meant to be about, relationship. We're in the middle of walking through the core values of who we are as a church. Even though we will change names, we will still maintain the exact same 
mission, and core values. And we've been walking through that, almost pretend like we are the, the launch team for Revival City Church. And we come across our sixth and final core value called loves radically. We want to be a church that loves radically. And this comes from scripture that talks about a couple of different places. Number one, where Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord kind of laid on our hearts this idea of we want to be a church that loves radically. We want to love in a way that doesn't make sense until it does. I don't, why do they do that? Why do they love? I don't get that. We want to love in a way that doesn't make sense until it does. That's the core value. But here's the reality. Jesus has said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's an end goal. That's an, like, this is a task we have to complete. But there's a problem within that, or there's a system to that, if you will. And if I work backwards, I have to understand that, A, there's a problem in some of those. You've, you've heard me say this before. For some of us in this room, please don't obey Jesus' words in that way. And you're like, what did the pastor just say? He said, love your neighbor as yourself. For some of you, please do not love your neighbor the way that you love yourself. Because for some of the people in the room, your view of yourself and how you love yourself is not grounded in the way that God loves you. So please do not love your neighbor the way that you love yourself. So in order for us to get to this place where we fulfill and live out the task of loving radically, we first have to know how radically we are loved. I can't start to talk about loves radically without beginning right there without doing everything I can, and it will still not be everything I could do to help you understand how radically you are loved. Our mission statement, even in itself, says to make disciples who experience, enjoy, and display God's love and God's glory. But displaying God's love was never meant to be done in place of experiencing and enjoying God's love. It was supposed to be the natural byproduct of experiencing and enjoying God's love. So that's why we start there. That was intros number four through seven. Thank you, Danae. She loves it. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. But again, we need to see what God's word has to say about this. You can't just be enthralled by a good intro. You have to be moved by truth in God's word. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. I think it will be up here on the board. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. If you remember in Genesis, it said, let us make man in our image. Image bearers is one of the things that was said. Tell me about the image of God from this passage of scripture. The character, the essence of God is love. From the beginning when he created, and when he created mankind, he created them to bear his image, and the essence of who he is, is love. It's not just your task. It is to be your everything. 
and to ruin it a little bit for a statement later on, love is not a destination. It is not a feeling. It is not, sorry, it's not limited to being a, de a destination. It's not limited to being a feeling. Love in its fullness is a person. Your destination and your purpose is not to be more loving. It's to be more Christ-like. It's to look and be more like God because you know him. Anyone who does not love doesn't know God. It's not a matter of, I need you to go home this week and to love harder. That would be trying to counterfeit a result that can only be, that would be trying to Ishmael a process that is only produced through right relationships. The promised son, the purpose, the covenant itself was Isaac through a relationship between Abraham and Sarah, not a maidservant to bear a child for that promise. Me telling you, go home and be more loving because God is more loving would be like me trying to force you to go home, find a maidservant, and make this thing happen. That's not the process. The process is when you know God, you will love like God. When you know how you are loved by God, you will love like God. For some of you, that means yourself. This is not a sermon where I'm just trying to preach a feel good, a literal feel good. I need you to feel good about yourself and walk out here a little better about yourself. I mean, that should ideally happen with the truth that Scripture is teaching us, right? But it produces within us something even beyond that. John 3.16, ever heard of it? For God so desperately needed people to worship him that he sent his only son. For God was so lonely that he needed to populate people around him that he sent his only son. In case you're not, we may have guessed this morning, in case you're not familiar with scripture, I'm not correctly quoting John 3.16. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect timing. Good job, Courtney. For God so what? Love. Love the world. Do you think this just sprang up on him? Do you think he created mankind, mankind messed up, and then he was like, oh, man, we got to, hold on, we got to rework some things. Plan B. And then just along the way, he developed a heart. See, some of us, we, we are people. God is a different kind of presence. His ways are higher than our ways, right? In my ways, for some of you people, if I'm being honest, it takes me a little while to love you more. I got to grow into it. I got to get to know I got to really grow to appreciate some of your quirks. You got to really learn to appreciate some of my quirks. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay. That's what we respond to the most of this sermon. Kristen, I heard your verse, voice first. I love each and every one of you who said amen. Just from the bottom of my God-filled heart. God has known the glorified, perfected version of you that will exist in all of eternity forever and ever before he even brought you into existence in this world. He has been so in love with you from the beginning that even while you were still yet in your sin, he sent Jesus to die for you. Some of us just get so wrapped up in the mess that we're in, the mess that we've been in, that we can't see the truth of how much he loves us. But he not only sees what's in you and what's available, he sees what you will become. You may struggle to believe this right now, but there is coming a day when not a single dot of sin will you even think about. Will you even be 
tempted to believe there's coming a day where sin won't even be around us to tempt us. In a perfected, glorified eternity with the Father. There's coming a day. What we read in Revelation says, a bride adorned in all white, a bright, brilliant white, which are the glorious deeds of the saints. I've talked about this before. Something happened between Isaiah who said, all of our good deeds are like filthy rags. And then all of a sudden, the church, it has been given to her to be adorned in a brilliant white with the good deeds of the saints. Somehow, filthy rags turn to a beautiful wedding dress. Again, guys, bear with me. If we ask girls to be brothers throughout Scripture, it says brothers a lot. Guys, we're also brides. We are part of the church. We are part of the bride of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. Romans 5, 8, I said this already, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you get that? Like, what the greatest love stories you've ever read, you've ever watched, they pale in comparison to the love story that is trying to be displayed to us right here, to the love story that has been done for us. What do you want? What do you need to be convinced that God loves you? What do you need for a person to show you that they love you? Think through this and this and this and this. God has done more than enough. Jesus says, I love you so much, I literally died for you to show you that I love you. And the love that I have for you is so strong, it brought me back to life, and it will bring you back to life. And we will live in the perfection and fullness of that love forever. The reality is, is that God has been pursuing his people all along. All along. Our sin causes us to run and hide from God with shame, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. They sinned. They betrayed God in the garden. And they sinned, realized their sin, and they hid in shame. Anybody ever do that? Some of us in this room struggle to receive the love of God because we're still hiding in shame. Some of us in this room, you're right for doing that. Because if you have never placed your trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, having believed that he actually did everything necessary for the complete forgiveness of your sins, every sins, all your sins, everything you've done, everything you have and will do, if you've never placed your trust in that, you have no hope. You have no access to this love. And so shame should rightly be yours but you don't have to stay there. That's the good news. Jesus died for you to walk confident and assured and loved and right before him. But some of us in the room, we've already received that, but we're living as though we need to still be punished for what we've done and as though it's not actually true in scripture when it says that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or that I believe his forgiveness I just don't know if his love can be covered. I have forgiveness of my sins, but his love for me is impacted. Again, can I remind you, he sees so much more than the you right now or than you last week. He sees the you forever and eternity. Don't lose sight of that. But God has been pursuing us all along. In the beginning, it began with Adam and Eve who in the garden betrayed him, yet he didn't give up on them, did he? They realized that they were naked, and he provided a covering for their sin. He literally provided, it says that they were covered with animal skins, which means the animals had to die. 
God began from the very beginning. Scripture says, without the pouring of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. From the very beginning in the garden, from the very first garden betrayal, God pursued the people he created by producing a system so that their sins could be covered over. Because he still wanted relationship with them. And they grew and they expanded. And he raised up a people for himself out of no people. Abraham was super old, super barren. I'm trying to be contextualizing to the college crowd. Super barren. (laughs) Yet he created an entire people group, an entire nation. Do you realize, like, everything that's going on in the news right now, those people, that nation, came from a guy that was like 100 years old and had no children. All of that and more. God raised up a nation. He led them out of captivity. He led them through the wilderness. He established a nation through them. And he established, he said, you know what? I don't want you to be alone. I want to be with you. So he gave to Moses the concept of the tabernacle. A place where he could meet with Moses face to face. And the system where they could offer covering sacrifices. For their sins. And then as they became a nation and entered to the promised land, he gave them a temple so that he could dwell among his people. He continued to pursue them. And even though their sin would cause cause them to suffer and the things that they decided, and the reality was that no amount of goats, no amount of heifers, no amount of animals, no amount of blood that was offered and needed and had to be offered day after day after day after day would ever be enough. So God pursued us ultimately in coming in the form of flesh, man, a child, born not in the king's courts, but in a manger. By humbling himself, he became human. Jesus was born so that Jesus would die. And I don't mean you born, you, you were born and you will die. I mean he was born so that he would be betrayed, crucified for your sake. Speaking of gardens, this is kind of a fun little illustration. God was betrayed in the garden. Do you remember where Jesus was when he was betrayed? The garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember where Jesus was buried? In a garden tomb. Do you remember who Mary thought Jesus was when she didn't realize who he was after he had resurrected? The gardener. There will be a new garden in a new city, on a new earth, in a new heaven. Just think about the beauty of a garden. Why did God create a garden and then create man and place him within the garden and then walk in that garden together with him if he didn't want to be with him? God didn't just show up for the day and say, okay, I'm ready for my daily worship. I was actually thinking that. I'm glad you did that. (laughs) He walked with them because he wanted to be with them. God has always been pursuing. He could have stopped long ago, but he has continued to pursue and to pursue and to pursue. And Jesus came and he died ultimately. And then he said something crazy. He said, there will be a new temple. It'll be you. I and the Father, we will make our home with you and in you. Jesus died, but Jesus rose. And then he said, hey, wait, something else is coming too. The Father's going to send an empowerment that you will need and you will love. And on the day of Pentecost, the flame was lit. The Holy Spirit in us, with us through us. God has been continuing to pursue us over and over and over. And I just want, I I love the power of testimony. Scripture testifies. 
to all of this, how God has been pursuing us. I actually, uh, Joel, why don't you come on up and make your way and grab that microphone over there. He was uh, sharing with me, was it, I don't know if it was yesterday, the day before, uh, about something, um, just a cool testimony that I love that shows God's heart for pursuing people. Many of us probably have testimonies of how God has pursued us. I just want to let Joel just kind of stir our faith a little bit and just share him briefly about uh, a couple of things that, that God has led him to do to be used to show how he pursues uh, other people. I'll try to make it quick. Um, so the Lord knows how to speak to each and every one of us. Um, coming from the military, he gives me missions or assignments, I, I guess I'm going to call them. Um, so he's been using me as a messenger. Uh, this has happened twice. Um, sitting with him in prayer and seeking him, he will speak to me and show me visions. And uh, these visions, I write down and I take a photograph of them and, and what he says to me. So that way they're, they're date and time stamped. And so both of these uh, assignments that he's given me, he has told me where to go, what day, what time, what the person's wearing, where I'm sitting, where they're sitting. Um, and let me tell you, out of obedience, uh, the first one, I mean, I drove two and a half hours. And to watch it unfold is just unbelievable. And just getting the nerve to go up to somebody and tell them why you're there and show them the photograph that you did two weeks earlier of what the Lord told you. And explaining exactly where they're wearing and where they're sitting. And then the message that the Lord gave to me to tell them. Well, yesterday was, so that was um, April 1st. April 3rd, the Lord spoke to me again and uh, gave me a vision. And this vision was at Cracker Barrel, <laughs> of all places. You weren't at Cracker Barrel. You had a vision about Cracker Barrel. Yes. Yep. It was a vision of the Cracker Barrel. And he told me to go on the 20th. And he showed me where I was sitting. And my mother was sitting in front of me. And he showed me who the waitress was, what she looked like, and what to say to her. And it's not that you're like a regular at Cracker Barrel and you have like no. a Rolodex of the waiters and waitresses. And you're like, okay. guys, like, it's that one. You know her, whatever, but she's going to be your waitress. It's, it's a. Yeah, I mean, I, you're I going somewhere. I don't you go don't there. Go. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not a regular at the Cracker Barrel. Um, but, uh, you know, and I had to tell my mother this because she's a part of it. And so I told her and showed her what the Lord told me and how it was going to play out. But, you know, I'm pulling in and I'm, you know, we have doubt. I'm pulling in thinking, well, I hope she's here. That's where I sit. So we... And I even drew a little sketch on where I was going to be sitting and the general store and the fireplace and all that stuff. But went up to the podium, and the girl took us straight to where I was going to be sitting. And uh, so then my mother, she's kind of looking at me like, planned. And then the waitress long brown hair, came up to the left side of me, just like I saw. And then it was trying to get the courage to, you know, my mother's hair, trying to get the courage to uh, talk to this girl and tell her what the Lord told me. So I tell her, and this girl, I mean, it was a sob fest in Cracker Barrel. And I looked at my mother, and I had to pick her jaw up off the table. <laughs> and... My mother told me, she goes, she goes, I thought you were full of crap. <laughs> Seeing things and hearing things from the Lord. And uh, she goes, I, she did. She goes, yeah, yeah. She's like, I can't, I don't understand this. I don't know, what's going on? 
And so she even called me this morning. She goes, I, I can't quit thinking about this. So, yeah. And I told her, you know, I said, this was for you also. Yeah. So, man. So, a recap here. So, he is somewhere, has, has an encounter with the Lord, and, and God says, I want you to go back to this location that's two and a half hours drive away on this date. There's going to be a guy, he's going to be sitting in this particular spot at that moment that you're there on this date in two weeks, right? Uh, and he's going to be wearing a black jacket, he's going to have dark hair, whatever, and I want you to go over and speak to him, right? Shows that, can you imagine the pressure? Of that, like, oh, I really hope this works out. Like, it's one thing to go to Cracker Barrel down the street. It's another to drive two, two and a half hours, like, to get to a place and hoping that this person that you saw was there and he's there, right? And the story that God has been brewing in Joel and through Joel is specifically purposeful for the story that this kid was going through and needed. Right, And then later, God says, now I want you to go to Cracker Barrel. Uh, this is where you're going to sit. There's going to be a, a waitress with brown hair who's going to walk up on your left, and you're going to speak to her. Your mom's going to be across from you, by the way, and you're going to share this. And he gets there. They take them to the exact spot. A brown-haired waitress comes up on the left side of him, and there they are, everything's together, and he shares what he feels like the Lord has told him to share, and she absolutely breaks down in tears. Why does she break down in tears? Because she sees that God sees her and loves her and is still pursuing her. Thank you for sharing, Joel. Yeah. I appreciate it. Man. God's never stopped pursuing. He's done everything necessary to be enough, but he still pursues. I love when God works like that. I, I, I still remember when uh, uh, I was together with, I don't know, maybe he was 17, 16 or 17, and, and we were praying through uh, this guy that Stephen and I were kind of discipling, and, and we were praying through, God, use us, take us somewhere. Where do you want us to go? And we were seeing different things. Like we were, we were seeing things that didn't make sense in our mind. We were seeing like this green sign or whatever, and then we saw tractors. We should have known later, but anyways, but a green sign, and then we see like tractors, and then we see uh, two letters, BB, like a BB, uh, like you think like a BB gun or whatever, and then we see like uh, a water, like a pond or whatnot, and as we're driving down the road, like, God, this doesn't make any sense, we're like, John Deere tractor, that's interesting, followed by a B&B &B auto, which that was another story that we brought into one time with the Lord gave us B&B &B auto, and then we sm I could smell smoke, and I saw a back, and we walk in there to this B&B &B auto, go into the, the, the lobby, and it reeks of smoke. I've never been more excited in my life <laughs> to smell smoke, cigarette smoke. And this old lady Charlotte comes walking out. She's kind of leaned over because she's got back pain. Yeah. You tell me why God would tell us that. Not she'd be like, hey, look how cool I am. He can't do that. But there was a greater assignment. He wanted her to know how much he loved her and how much he saw her still. By the way, she walked out, no back pain. Oh, yeah. okay. But we're going by in the first story, John Deere tractor sign. But that should have should have thought to do that. A B and B thing. Wow, that is crazy. Here's, here's like a waterway, and it leads us into a park, and we're going around, and it leads us to a pond where we're at, and we're sitting there. God, what do you want us to do? It's us, it's me, and this 17-year-old kid and a cop car. Let's just sit and wait for the person that God wants. <laughs> Nobody's coming. You ever knocked on a cop car's window before <laughs> while he's in the car? <laughs> Don't recommend that. <laughs> like, so one of those, like, I'm knocking, but I'm, I'm away from the vehicle. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack you or whatnot. And begin a conversation with him. And to hear this 17-year-old who's never done this before just start sharing what the Lord laid on his heart. He's like, okay, well, have a nice day. Thank you for like, letting us share, whatever. And we go to drive away, and he's like, man, we got to go back. Like, I just feel like the Lord is telling me that like, this guy actually like, believes but has never like, followed through with obedience and baptism, and he needs to obey. I'm like, you, you want me to drive back? 
through the police officer, so you can tell him that? <laughs> He's like, yeah, man, I feel it in my heart. Okay. So we get back, and the dude is walking around looking at the ducks. He's like, got that face like, what just happened to me? Right? And, and the kid walks up, and he goes, this is what I feel like the Lord says. And he goes, you're right. I'm going to get baptized at my church next Sunday. God still pursues. And what's so great, and we'll talk through in a second, is that he wants to pursue people together with you. He's still pursuing you in relationship, and he's still pursuing others in relationship. We have to understand that God is still after us. And just as a reminder, in case we haven't understood this yet, let me just read a couple of more verses that talks about God loves you. Because I really need you to get this this morning. If you get nothing else, I need you to walk out and understand how radically you are loved. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his what? Love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You tell me what he thinks about you, according to his word. David wrote Psalm 17, verse 8, saying, Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Did you guys know that that phrase, the apple of, of someone's eye, is actually from Scripture? Keep me as the apple of your eye. And some of you might just be like, okay, I hear it. But, but like that was David. Like David was, was apple of, of, uh, 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 of it and, and, and that. That's a desire that, like David's saying, like he wants to be the apple of God's eye, not necessarily what God's saying. Well, two things. Number one, it says, keep me as the apple of your eye. So in order to be kept as the apple of your eye, you must originally be the apple of his eye, number one. And number two, that's fine. You want to say, okay, that maybe that's just for David? Well, let's see what Zechariah has to say about how God feels about his people. Zechariah Chapter 2, verse 8, for thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, talking to Israel, God's people, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Whoever messes with you messes with the apple of my eye, says the Lord. God created you with so much love. You are the apple of his eye. And for some of you, that's all you've wanted to be since you were a little kid. Whether you can identify or articulate that or not, you wanted to be the apple of someone's eye. And I'm here to tell you, you always have been. You were created in his eye. With love. I'm going to share, we're going to walk through real quick something that is really important as we come to a close. I'm going to walk through a few different things, and I actually, this is different, but I'm going to have, can you, can, uh, Courtney, can you put up the QR code um, on the side? I'm actually going to walk us through some different viewpoints of how we imagine ourselves with God, and if you follow that QR code, if you're listening online, you can't see that on the side screen, it's phoenixathens.com slash views, V-I-E-W-S. Sorry, sorry phoenixathens.church slash views, V-I-E-W-S, right? These are just going to be some notes, and I don't go ahead of me or what I want you to have this. I want you to have access to it as we walk through it. But there's a few things that I need you to understand. A.W. Tozer makes an interesting comment. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us because the way we think about him impacts the way we think about how he views us and how we interact with him, right? It's so important. I don't have time to go through this, but I love it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a couple of things that uh, a, a mentor, pastor, friend of Stephen and I uh, has just kind of shared and taught on and poured, poured into our lives there's this thing, if you want to imagine a, a pyramid, at the top of it, where a lot of us want to go to, is destiny. 
why did, like, why did God uniquely create me? What is it for? What am I to do? All these different things. But that's the top part of a four-tiered pyramid, if you will. And you have to get everything underneath it right to understand that correctly. And at the bottom base of that pyramid is identity. You have to know who you are. And when you understand who you are, the next step can happen. Intimacy. When you understand who you are rightly, you will understand and receive and live in and from and not toward intimacy. And then inheritance. Because of who I am and the intimacy that I have, what do I have access to? And then ultimately, because of all of those things, how does God want me to live or carry out his purpose as long as I have breath within that destiny? So what I want to walk us through are, are five different views. I'm not saying this is an exhaustive um, list of anything, um, but these are five different views that people can often find themselves in, and I want us to walk through them really quickly because it's important for you to realize there may be thoughts that you have in your mind regarding you and God that are impacting your ability to receive and understand and live in and live from the love that God has for you. Your identity with God is a little bit jacked up, and it affects your intimacy with God. And when those aren't right and you're on shaky ground and you're trying to go to the destiny part where you're living out the love that you're supposed to live from, it's messed up. Now, I want to say that it is possible to be a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, and to still have some of these wrong beliefs. Because a lot of these beliefs are based in a truth that is in Scripture, but it's a skewed view, or it's over Oh, it's overly emphasized view of certain things that may be grounded or started from truth, but have been kind of distorted, okay? So I want us, as you're walking through, to identify, do I think that way? Do I believe that way, okay? So the first one, there's, there's five different views of how you can view yourself in God. There's under God, there's over God, there's from God, there's for God, and there's with God. We're going to start with the first one, under God. This is what we would call the moral life, okay? Obedience or disobedience produces good or bad results. You're going to try, if you're trying to write this down, I'm going to go ahead and tell you you're not, you're, you're not going to be able to keep up, okay? So you're going to have to come back to the video or just use the notes here. I'm reading from the notes. Obedience or disobedience produces good or bad results. We put God in our debt and expect God to do our bidding in exchange for our worship for our worship and righteous behavior. Faith is reduced to dogmatism. Here's a possible view of yourself you might have if this is the view. I'm a sinner, a despicable being living under the constant threat of God's wrath and punishment who must appease his will through strict obedience to moral and ritual commands. Through our obedience and moral life, we expect God to do our bidding and bless us. Because I am obedient, because I am living morally, God, therefore, should be doing these things. The outcome of this, we end up using God to control one's life and the world around us. A biblical example of this comes from Isaiah 29:13. Where, it said, where God says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship, their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. The message that comes from believing like this says, I need to be good to be loved. If I do right, I will be right with God. God will punish me if I do not behave the right way. Ever have these thoughts? Your relationship with the Lord based in this? Your understanding of how God loves you or doesn't love you is completely wrapped in how moral or immoral you're acting, how righteous or unrighteous. Again, you can see here, there are truths in here. <laughs> Our relationship is impacted by sin, but there's a skewed view. 
The next one is over God, and we would call that one the independent life. We consider God as the asset manager. You follow the right principles as a way to guarantee a good life, get God to bless you, and meet your needs. This reduces the Bible from God's revelation of himself to merely a revelation of divine principles for life. Almost as if you just view scripture as a whole like the book of Proverbs. These are good things. If I do those good things, good things will happen. But, you know, it's, it, that's just kind of, this isn't really like, I, I'm not really focused or really just thinking through like this is a revelation of who God is to me. This is a love letter to me. This is an invitation to know who it is who loves me so much and what he's inviting me into and what he has to say about me. This is more so just, this is really good procedures. Wise even procedures. You can navigate life safely if you just follow the right map. It exchanges a relationship with God for applicable principles. Your view of self might be that I am a manager. I'm an autonomous being who has been given a divine manual for operating my life in the world and whose fate ultimately rests on how well I implement God's manual and instructions. You may form a belief that by following God's principles, we expect God to meet our needs and make us successful. The outcome is that we end up using God as a source for practical help, success, and advice. And this is where the prosperity gospel comes from. If I just apply all these rules, then I can expect God to bless me. If I do A, B, and C, then God will do D, E, and F. I did the formula. I did the thing. Therefore, I'm owed. That's over God, the independent life. The next one, not too far from this, but has a slightly different bent, is from God or the self-centered life. And immediately your mind wants to be like, well, I know that one's got to be wrong, so I'm just, that can't be me <laughs> at all. Just listen to what it has to say. It sees God as a cosmic genie, places self with your desires as the center and most important part of life. Consumerism with a Jesus sticker slapped on the bumper. It's okay, yeah, I just do all these things because I, you know, I still got Jesus. I'm good. God gives and we get to receive. Purpose comes from identifying and fulfilling one's desires. We desire what God can give us more than we desire God himself. I'm going to do a little spoiler alert at the end. There's going to be a question when you go through all these, like where do I fit? Like what do I how do I determine like what I may be believing or how I may be acting? One of those questions is going to be, what does your prayer life look like? No, 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 I'm not the self-centered. I'm not, I'm, I'm, that's, that's not me, right? Okay, well, let's just go through the log of what you've been specifically praying unto the Lord. Which category would you put all these? Because it seems as though you're more concerned with what God can give you than getting God himself. God exists, sorry, um, view of self can be I am a consumer, a discontent being composed of unmet desires and longings who demands all things, people, and even God to orbit around me and fulfill my expectations. Can create a belief that God exists to meet my needs and fulfill my desires. Outcome is that I end up using God to serve myself and we replace God at the center about me. Narcissism, right? This produces the consumer gospel. The Lord meets all our needs. He is about my needs and my comfort and what I prefer. But the problem here is that scripture reminds us in multiple places, kind of like the rich young ruler and even the multiple seeds, how the, how the desires of the world choke out the seed from being able to grow up. We are reminded multiple times in places that sometimes comfort can be the very thing that keeps us from experiencing, enjoying, and displaying God's love and glory. 
Uh, this one-sided view skews the purpose of our life. Uh, I, I heard a phrase uh, that's funny, and I'm a pastor, so I, I, I'm going to say it. Um, that a pastor's role is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Sorry if your chair gets a little prickly this morning. That's from God, the self-centered life. For God, the serving life. Oof. My, my, my mentor would say this was where he was when God wrecked him. He was in this place, chiefly. For God, the serving life. Sees God as an army general. Sees a divine mission at the core of all things. A life of self-sacrifice for the mission to truly experience and get God's result and blessings. Values doing things for God as more than God himself. Values doing things for God more than they value God himself. Idolizes being in full-time ministry and full-time service. Again, the phrase, Stephen, how does it go? The work of the ministry. The doing of God's work alone. He said, my presence will lead you into the doing of my work. But the doing of my work alone will often lead you out of my presence. This creates a view of self that says, I am a servant, a worker created to fulfill a great mission whose sense of value is inextricably linked to what I am able to accomplish and the magnitude of my impact. Do you think God loves you more or less because you have made a bigger impact in the world? Do you think God loves you more because you've worked more, Martha? I'm not talking to you, Martha Vaughn. I'm referring to Mary and Martha. I love you, Mary. Actually, you know what? I think there's something on that. Yeah, I love you, Mary. You do a good job of being a Mary. <laughs> a belief. We get our sense of identity by serving God and doing things for him so that he will be pleased with us. Oof. It uses God to give us meaning and purpose. I have to do more. I can always do better. Doing is a means to get God's pleasure towards us. Then there's the last one. I, I lean into that, lead into the last one, which is, by the way, the right I'm reminded of the reality of, in my house growing up as a kid, my parents don't still live there, but there were so many things in that house that I built. I built, especially the stuff out of wood, I built. Now, the reason I say that is because I was with my dad when he built all the things in the house, but we did it together. Now, you know, how much do you think I really contributed to the building of those things that I had no idea what they were or how to make them? But what was the point? I'm sure my dad was teaching me how to use tools, how to operate safety, how he was, he was instilling skills within me, but what was the point? Because he could do it, I promise you, way faster without me being there and probably way better than if I would put my hand to any part of it. What was the point of me being there? Spending time with him. See the Father's heart in this. With God, the secure life. Security in God's presence instead of striving for God's presence. I'm in God's presence. I have security in God's presence instead of having to strive to get to God's presence. Collaboration with over performing for God. 
It sees prayer as communion, not just conversation. I'm a child of God, not because of who I am, but because of whose I am. God is not a means to an end. He is the goal and you are the treasure. Knowing Jesus is the destination. We're not trying to get somewhere, we're trying to get to someone. Understanding all of this begins to peel away what we do from who we are. And I love how our mentor put it. He would say, he would talk about this moment where he was with God trying to have a vision for the future in ministry. What He was saying, God, what do you want me to do? Just tell me. I want to do exactly what you want to do. This is a great prayer, isn't it? I want, to, I want to know your will and I want to succeed in doing your will. Would you just tell me what to do? And he said he heard the Lord say, son, I love that you want to be about my work. I love that. I love that you want to do what's on my heart. I love that you want to know my will, but I need you to understand you are my will. From the beginning, a relationship with him has been his will. That's what we need to understand. We can't be so focused on the doing, 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 accomplishing, 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 earning, 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 which isn't the gospel, that we miss that we are the will, we are the purpose, we are the thing that is after his heart. In his heart, together with God is what he wants. And he told them, you're asking a doing question. You're asking a, what can I do? You're asking a doing question when I'm trying to get you to understand a being purpose. I wanna be with you. I wanna do life with you and show you personally the what, when, where, and why. Just like when, when God told Abraham, hey, leave this place and go to a place that I will show you. What would our questions be? What would you ask God? Where are we going? When are we going? Are we gonna come back? What should I pack? We can be so focused on the what, where, when, and why of this thing called life that we miss out on the most important thing. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter what, because it's together with him. He wants to do it together with you. And whether that's in an awesome, amazing, fruitful time of ministry, or it's walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it's together with him. Let me just give you a little word of encouragement. If you currently find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, sometimes in your life, you've reached a mountain peak with God and it's amazing, but there's more, there's higher. It's just not on this mountain. So you gotta go down through the valley to the next mountain, which is higher. Valley's not your home. That is not your forever. You're not alone. Not alone. So again, which category am I in? How do I know? And some of you guys are like, nope, I know, I'm aware. I'm that one and that one and that one and that one. But if you want to know how you can walk through those, and I encourage you, and it's going to be part of the next steps to walk through those and sift with God, where do I think this? Ask the questions, how do you respond when things don't go your way? How you answer that question right there, how you respond when things don't go your way will give you insight into how you respond. You know what? Things don't go my way. I get really offended at God because I have been doing the right. I have been living righteously. I have never once done this or this or this that other people have done. I don't understand why God's not doing this for me. Or maybe I have done A, B, and C through scripture. Why is D, E, and F not happening? I'm frustrated by that. Or I, I don't understand, God's, God's for my comfort. Why, why am I experiencing discomfort? 
everything is opportunity together with God. So I want to encourage you. Oh, the last one, the, uh, uh, how you can determine which of these are me is your values. How are they exposed? Values are exposed in how we spend our time, energy, and resources, and in what is allowed to emotionally impact us, what excites us, and what offends or hurts us. Those things reveal what our true values are. And from that, we can determine where we're at. And again, I already said, what does your prayer life look like? Assess your prayer life. What are the literal things you're praying to God and do they line up with some of these categories in a way that maybe should be modified? Stand with me real quick. I want to reiterate the fact. Stephen, can you take this one, please? I want to reiterate the fact that the point of this list is not to show you how you, you're just jacked up. You've messed up. You don't understand this correctly. The point of this list is for you to understand that there's more to grow in in the love that God has for you. Please see that you have always been on his heart. You have always been his plan. And he wants you forever and ever. Here, by the way, and now is part of forever endeavor. Can I just say that? Salvation wasn't the end goal, it was the introduction. Prayer and ministry team, will you guys go ahead and make your way down to the front? I I didn't prep you guys with this, but I just want to say something. Some people in the room um, might be hearing what I'm saying and their heart's desire. I'm saying this to everybody. Your heart's desire may be, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm just really struggling to experience and enjoy God's love and glory right now. Father, I pray over these people that as they pray over your people, that you would speak to them words of truth and encouragement and life. I pray for anybody who is struggling to understand through experience and enjoyment of your love, Father, that you would tailor an encounter for them even today that cannot be explained away other than the fact that you see them and you are pursuing them. Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would increase our ability to perceive and comprehend the love with which you have loved us and still love us and are loving us unto. Sweep us away with the incredibly smaller in comparison to your love. We pray these things saying we love 